Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. In this podcast, we are going to interview researchers from Pulse Academia and Industry about their work, thoughts, spectrum, and more beyond that. This is Marwa Edwini, and I hope you will find this podcast useful. If you would like to connect with us, simply send us, and we will be happy to hear from you. And here is my interview. Thanks. Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. Hello, Professor Stephen. Thanks so much for joining us in the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you. I'd like to ask you first how you would like to define yourself, maybe for people first time listening to you. Well, um, I mean, I guess in simple terms, uh, I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. But I think more broadly, um, I like to think of myself as someone who teaches mathematics to engineers. That's really my passion um, is kind of communicating uh, the beauty and power of applied math to kind of anyone who is in a position to use it. Um, so that's really, really what I love to do. Uh, and so oftentimes that means writing or making videos or things like that. Um, I have a pretty big group. And so we do a lot of research in um, dynamical systems and controls, especially targeted towards fluid dynamics applications. Mm -hmm. um, so those are kind of three, you know, three hats that I wear at, at different times. Wonderful, yeah. So I'm going to ask you, what is the relation between physics and math? What, what is something is common between both of them? Or maybe completely different? Between phys like physics and math. And math, yeah. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And I mean, it's a little philosophical. So I mean, I think there's there's fantastic quotes by, by actual, you know, great physicists and mathematicians. Yeah. You know, physics and mathematics is the language um, the universe uses to express itself, things like that. Um, for me, you know, I, I use a lot of physics and a lot of math in, in my day to day. And I guess, you know, I do think of mathematics as kind of this extremely expressive language. It's a playground. You can do anything you want in mathematics. You can define a numbering system that's completely different than the counting system that we grew up with. Physics constrains that. And physics kind of brings that down to reality. So for me, you know, they're, they're two sides of the same coin, but mathematics is very expressive and creative and open-ended. Physics is very much, you know, the constraints that make the world work. Um, and I, I think of them as really as being constraints to the mathematics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious about the YouTube videos you're doing. I think one of the things is interesting about fluid mechanics, but me, I'm curious to ask you first, why you started the YouTube videos? And you explain it in a very interesting way, yeah. What motivation for you to, to make the series? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, I love teaching. It's it's always been a passion of mine. And I think, you know, largely I've, I've had great teachers. So I've been really fortunate that I've had some fantastic instructors in my life who have really inspired me and made a big difference. And so, you know, the soonest, as soon as I was able to, to start having that kind of an impact, I was really excited about doing that for, for other people as well. Um, very practically speaking, um, my students, you know, in my lab were, I needed them to know control theory. <laughs> and I felt like kind of what they were learning was, I mean, it was very useful and um, kind of advanced theoretical control theory, but I didn't feel like they were getting the kind of nuts and bolts, practical applied control theory. Like they didn't have that gut feeling of stability and, and margins and things like that. And so in my lab, um, I ran a little boot camp. You know, I think there were 10 or 15 people and we just worked on a, on a whiteboard, you know, two or three hours a week. And it was just trying to get them up to speed as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And once I did that, I realized, you know, probably there's other people that would like this kind of really, really distillate uh, control theory knowledge. Um, and I think I had a pretty fortunate background. Like, you know, I learned control theory for some really brilliant people, Richard Murray at Caltech, uh, Clancy Rowley at Princeton. And so I felt like, you know, this is a pretty special perspective that I really wanted to kind of share out. Um, and so that, that's where it started. And then once people, you know, it's kind of addictive once people catch on and start watching and, you know, and commenting and giving you feedback, you know, it just makes you want to make more videos on new topics and things yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I would focus uh, in fluid mechanics. Why is it so hard? And I think one of the things interesting you said about the relation between physics and machine learning when it comes to combining both of them. You can tell us some more about why it's so hard and how you can consider that 
I mean, physics and machine learning, what could be precautions in designing them to solve this optimization problem as we see in nature? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, so fluid mechanics um, is, is beautiful. So this is the first thing I think I want to point out is that you know, all of us from the time we were little children have been probably amazed by fluids at some point, whether it's clouds roiling or, you know, a stream, you know, turbulence in a stream forming, kind of fluids are very deep and special to us as humans. They're part of our art, uh, they're part of our culture, and, you know, all of our machines and us, we live and breathe and work in fluids. So, you know, it, it's part of the human experience. And it's extremely challenging in the sense that so I like to do an analog between uh, gas dynamics and kind of turbulent fluids. So gas dynamics is this incredible success story of coarse grained modeling, where you know I have uh, Avogadro's number of, of gas molecules bouncing around in a you know volume of, of gas, but I can very effectively average the behavior, this extremely complex behavior, into a few key numbers, kind of the thermodynamics of the situation. And this was one of the great success stories of, of physics is going from, you know, 10 to the 26 particles down to, you know, a couple of numbers. We've been trying to do something similar for turbulent fluids for the last hundred years. And every time we've, we've tried this, we've hit a wall, a brick wall. And it's a number of, of factors are conspiring here. One is that it's a fundamentally nonlinear physics. The Navier-Stokes equations are nonlinear. Uh, structures convect. Uh, you know, and travel and move and small structures affect big structures and big structures affect small structures and it's highly coupled. And so there's no clear way to separate the scales. Um, so that, that, that's one of the challenges. It's also very high dimensional to uniquely describe a snapshot of a fluid. If you just take, you know, a river and you want to, in, you know, take an instance of that river there might be billions or even trillions of degrees of freedom that you would need to write down to uniquely characterize what that river is doing at that moment. Mm -hmm. And it's very multi-scale in space and time. There's things that are very, very fast and very, very slow. Um, so it's a tricky problem on all fronts. It's theoretically challenging. We don't have good techniques for solving nonlinear partial differential equations. Uh, it's computationally super challenging. Um, even with Moore's law, it would take us a hundred years before we can solve some of the problems we want to solve. Um, yeah, so it's 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 a really fun and interesting problem, but it also just you know it's fun to look at the solutions when you yeah. see them. Yeah, yeah. But curious uh, when you see the example, you, you mentioned example for the eagle, for example, and I guess that's cute. We need these since nature already demonstrated what we're trying to solve. What could be still the missing pieces? Do you think when you look from a broader view and, and and what we do in our research, what could be still missing, do you think? What is the missing visa like then? Yeah, um, I mean, so the Eagle is such a good example of a system that is expertly interacting with very, very complicated flow fields. And, you know, they can glide on thermals and they can kind of almost collect the turbulence into vorticity mm -hmm. on their wings. Um, I think there's a lot of things missing. So that, that's actually one of the reasons I joke around that I'm gonna keep showing that movie until we as engineers can do something similar. So in other words, basically for my whole career, I'm gonna be showing that movie. Um, so I think there's a, a few things missing. I mean, the Eagle has, we think, you know, a deep experience base uh, of flying and not just its own experience, but kind of the codified experience of its ancestors, right? Like they're, are generations of expert flyers who have kind of culminated into this uh, into this flying creature. And if you just think of the learning times and the amount of data that an evolutionary time scale accounts for, you know, this still makes reinforcement learning look pretty uh, pretty insignificant as, as we do it today. So I think that that's important for us to recognize that like, Kind of evolutionary systems and, and evolutionary timescales are, are pretty massive. Um, plus, it's it's not one eagle, one eagle's you know direct descendants. It's also the thousands and thousands of cousin eagles that you know maybe were not as good at flyers or learned different different things. Um, you know this kind of ensemble learning. Also, I think that eagles and other biological systems have this incredible embodied sensing. So um, you know. 
they have feathers and an incredible um, kind of inertial guidance system that I think you know goes pretty far beyond anything we can build today. And so in some sense, they have the hardware to feel their environment. And I think that, you know, I always challenge my, my students and, and anyone who will listen that if you picture yourself as that eagle and you close your eyes, you can almost picture yourself flying and you can almost feel the turbulence on your wings. And I have all the confidence in the world that we could also learn pretty rapidly how to use that information and kind of fly or swim or move because that's something that biological systems do. We have you know, distributed sensors and a body and that body becomes a part of, you know, of our mind. Like we embody our automobiles when we drive. It's um, very natural for us. It takes time to learn, but we're able to just completely make that an extension of our, ourselves. And I, I think that's a pretty interesting thing that the biology does. Yeah, that's very interesting. Let's ask you about in that case about modeling because you mentioned, for example, uh, what could be interesting um, parameters in, in the designing or optimization when it comes to flow mechanics? And since you mentioned it's also highly uh, expensive in terms of computation simulation as well. So before going to other techniques, but before that, what could be more interesting to you when it comes to figuring out that could be very critical in optimization? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So I think that's an important idea that Oftentimes, the end goal of what we want to do with a fluid is relatively low dimensional. It's relatively simple. Maybe there's, so I always think about things in terms of dimensions and how big the numbers are, right? So the fluid itself might have millions, billions, trillions of degrees of freedom. But my eagle, you know, I, let's, let's take me. I'm a very simple person. Maybe there's 10 things I care about at any given time. That's, and that's being pretty generous to me. You know, my, the dimension of the, the space I operate in is pretty low dimensional. And I assume that the eagle is also pretty low dimensional. Um, you know, it wants to maintain lift and drag and be able to turn efficiently. It wants to not hit itself on a rock. It wants to go get a lunch, you know, if it's hungry. So it's a pretty low dimensional control space. I mean, maybe that's an overestimation. I mean, it can move its, its arms pretty, mm -hmm. in a pretty high dimensional way. But the decisions it's making on a daily basis are low dimensional. And so I think what this means is that it doesn't need to care about all of those billions of degrees of freedom in the fluid. There are certain patterns, there are certain coherent structures that matter to its daily life that it wants to exploit and characterize. And so I think that's actually um, kind of in my lab, we take this, this uh, kind of unified or holistic view that even in very complex systems, we believe that there are patterns in that data that matter to us, that matter for our high level control objective. Maybe that pattern for the eagle is a leading edge vortex that allows it to turn efficiently. Um, those patterns, the fact that there are maybe 10 or 20 patterns instead of a billion degrees of freedom, that means I can sense the system efficiently. I don't need a billion measurement probes. I might need 20 or 30. Maybe my feathers do a good enough job to tell me the information I need about those patterns. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the fact that there are those low dimensional patterns also means that instead of simulating this supercomputer full turbulent fluid, I just need to know how those patterns evolve in time, not even that well, pretty well. And then I can develop a control algorithm around it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that, that's the strategy we take is it's all boils down to patterns existing in the data. And back to your earlier question, I think that really is kind of the, the unifying theme of physics and machine learning. Both of these operate on the assumption that even in very complex interaction physics, we get these emergent patterns. You get galaxies and solar systems and human beings and eagles, which are patterns. <laughs> um, and you know, all of machine learning also operates on this kind of idea of, of uh, if there weren't patterns in your data, we'd be hopeless, we'd mm -hmm. be sunk. But we know there are, so that's good. Yeah. Interesting, maybe I could ask you, is it maybe um, a dominant to have a pattern always in any system you try to design maybe you truly try to uh, design something maybe have never been existed in nature. What does the case like look like if you don't have a better in that case? That's a that's a really interesting question. Um, so we won't know what those patterns are. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I still fundamentally assume that there are going to be patterns. Like if if something is simple enough to control and to be useful, 
then it's going to be highly ordered and organized. So if we think about our machines, like, um, you know, we for, for, for millennia have been watching birds and eagles flying and we wanted to fly and we wanted to build machines that fly. So of course, Da Vinci developed, you know, flapping robots and, and invented some weird things that, that uh, animals don't do like helicopters and, and yeah. gyrocopters and things. If we look at our, you know, modern jet engines, they look nothing like, you know, any biological system we've seen. But the common pattern is that they're extremely ordered and organized. And they take this, you know, complexity of the Navier Stokes and of turbulence, and they kind of channel that into this ordered, uh, ordered pattern. And so I think that's, that's just a, a property of, of machines in general and of, you know, mm-hmm. what are robots and humans and animals except, you know, very, very, very complicated thinking machines. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd like to ask you also again about model order reduction when it used to simulation, for example. You mentioned that maybe you have to be careful about interpolation and extrapolation as well. If you can elaborate more about that and what you think may be alternative beyond model order reduction, for example. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so the idea of interpolation versus extrapolation is something that I think is underappreciated, honestly, when people are working on machine learning. And this idea that extrapolation is always dangerous and difficult, and it's important. We need to be able to extrapolate. So, okay, interpolation means, you know, if I have some data, I can basically explain the data I've already seen, or, um, or I can kind of, if I only have maybe uh, temperature data for the last 10 decades, but I only have it uh, once every 10 years, can I fill in the other nine years every decade that I haven't seen? That's interpolation. Extrapolation would be, can I use the training data of the last 100 years to predict the next 100 years of the climate? That's much, much harder, clearly important. We need to be able to forecast, to predict, to see where things are going, right? Like that's what modeling should be valuable for, is not just understanding the past, but really predicting the future. And this became really clear to me when uh, I was working with an algorithm that we use all the time in fluid mechanics called the dynamic mode decomposition. This is like the workhorse algorithm, really, really important. Um, And what it does is it takes a a data set, a, a data set that varies in space and in time, and it decomposes it into a small set of modes that are kind of each oscillating at their own frequency. Very simple. It's kind of like a high dimensional Fourier transform. And I took a video, um, this was work with Nathan Kutz and Josh Proctor. We took a video of a ball rolling on a desk. And this is again, a high dimensional spatial temporal data set. I just took my iPhone and I watched this ball roll across a desk. Mm -hmm. And we thought, okay, it's very low dimensional. It's one ball and it's moving at one velocity. So if you run this algorithm on a video of the ball rolling across the desk and you ask it to predict the future, because this gives you a model, you can use this to predict what will happen in the future. What happens after the ball reaches the end of the video is that it turns right around and it rolls back and then it rolls forward and then it rolls back because I'm building my solution out of sines and cosines. I'm interpolating. I'm trying to extrapolate, but I can only interpolate between what I've seen. Mm -hmm. And so this extremely kind of counterintuitive uh, failure case of a very simple algorithm that we all use daily pretty much in my field um, really got us thinking this is a visceral, uh, you know, example of, yeah. of overfitting and, and extrapolation being hard. So, and, and that was, you know, before everyone was going crazy for deep learning in, in the physical sciences. And deep learning suffers sometimes even more from this idea of, um, it's, it's fantastic for interpolation. It is the best function approximation tool you're going to find if you have enough data to build a function that approximates that data but it tells you nothing about what's outside of that data. Mm-hmm. So for example, if I, if I take data of a cannonball trajectory, you know, and I train on the first, uh, first half of the trajectory, mm-hmm. most deep learning algorithms are gonna fail to predict where that cannonball is gonna go because that's not in the data. Like there's literally no support for that, that second half of the trajectory in the data. Um, and actually, this is where I see physics coming in and being so critically important. In, in all of the history of human development and engineering and science for the last thousands of years across you know, pretty much every example I can think of, the only models that generalize, that extrapolate 
are physics models. In fact, that's a pretty good working definition of physics mm -hmm. are the models that generalize well. So, you know, and physics doesn't just have to be F equals MA or E equals MC squared, right? Like we believe that social networks have a physics of types. Um, our brains probably there's some, and I don't just mean the biological physics, but there's some organizational patterns and rules that generalize. We might not be able to write them down, but that to me is my definition of physics. It's the rules that generalize. Mm -hmm. And so that is such an important concept in machine learning is we should be learning the rules that generalize. We should be learning the physics. And if we know some of the physics, we should be constraining our learning with that. I, I think they're almost, uh, you know, in the next decades, they're gonna become inseparable concepts uh, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think this point is very important and serious. I'm curious to ask you in that case about nonlinearities because speaking about fluid mechanics is not highly nonlinear. And we see sometimes simulation tools tend to linearize system, avoiding this in material, for example, hysteresis, and isotropy. And, and we have a tendency to neglect nonlinearities. And even we have discussion how we can use nonlinearities to achieve interesting behavior in material like deformation. How do you see the community learn dealing with nonlinearities when it comes to simulation of fluid mechanics, if it's very interesting? How do you see the gap here between simulation and reality and dealing with nonlinearities? Yeah, um, it's, it's a really insightful point. Um, and I, you know, so anyone who's simulating the full Navier Stokes equations is, of course, tackling the nonlinearity. So, you know, there's a large community of people who are uh, designing and optimizing and simulating, you know, the, 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 the actual fluid mechanics. Um, but there is a, the other community, and I guess I'm, I'm kind of more in this linearizing camp, uh, which is we're trying to oversimplify. And there's nothing simpler to us than linear systems, low dimensional linear systems. And if we think about why we're doing this, I would say it's probably mostly due to the fact that all of our powerful tools, all of our tools that um, are generic are for linear systems, right? So like all of my control theory <laughs> that, uh, that I can apply easily in MATLAB, it's for linear systems, right? Um, now that's not to say that there aren't powerful tools for nonlinear systems, but they're not generic. They're, they're kind of customized or tailored or bespoke to that particular nonlinearity or that particular problem. And that means it's very expensive in, in human time. It requires a human expert to really spend a lot of time customizing this control algorithm or this analysis procedure for that nonlinearity. Um, and you're right, fluids is a good example. Thousands and thousands of researchers over hundreds of years have been tailoring their hard work, their entire careers to this one quadratic nonlinearity in the fluid flow equations. And we still don't have it cracked. We still haven't solved it yet, so. Yeah. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. So maybe you can take a question and we go to audience question because you don't have a lot of time. So the last question, what do you think maybe uh, something maybe in modeling, you expect it to work out very well um, maybe an empirical result. But when you come to reality, it was unexpected or counterintuitive to what you expected in modeling or theory. Do you have any something like that happen to you? I, I do. I think um, maybe I'll take an answer a slightly related question. Um, there is an example of kind of a discovery we made that was just completely unexpected because we were playing around with an algorithm. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, so we, we developed, um, so actually related to your question about nonlinear modeling, you know, we basically wanted a nonlinear system identification algorithm, which when I was growing up in my kind of grad school days, nonlinear system ID was not something that you knew how to do. Like I wanted to build a nonlinear model from data. I didn't know how to do it. This was not a set of tools that we had available to us. And so that's something I've been working on and, and my collaborators and team have been working on for you know, the last 10 years now. And we have an algorithm we really like uh, called CINDY, the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. But this isn't about CINDY. So we, we wrote that original paper showing that we can do nonlinear system identification. And one of our referees asked a really good question. They said, well, your algorithm is measuring all of the variables that matter, the whole state vector. But in most systems, you're not measuring everything that matters. You don't even know what to measure. So what happens if you measure, you know, just a, a small subset of the relevant variables and there's hidden variables? And we thought, boy, that's a really good question. <laughs> we should think about this. So, um, 
so we started going kind of going back into the literature and looking up this old uh it's not that old from the 80s on Tocken's time delay theory so if you have limited measurements of a complex system often you can augment those measurements with time delayed versions so just the same measurement from the past and create a vector of time delays and that vector gives you a lot of information about the full system mm -hmm. so we decided to do that and we ran our nonlinear system identification algorithm on that time delayed vector. And what we found is that the best model that best supported the data in time delay coordinates was not, in fact, a nonlinear model, but was completely linear. And so this kind of gets back to your question earlier also is we found this very interesting case where even though we had a strongly nonlinear system, when we measured it in the right coordinate system, in this case, time delay coordinates, the best model for those dynamics were perfectly linear. And this kind of blew us away. Um, we, were, we were shocked that this happened. And it's super useful because you can do linear control and linear estimation and prediction in those time delay coordinates. So there's some deep connections with the mathematical theory of the Koopman operator that we've since developed. And, and many of our colleagues have done you know, a really nice job mathematically developing this. Um, but we were we were kind of shocked. We still don't really understand exactly what's going on. We're still this is very much a mystery in, in some ways. Just I kind of I kind of took your question a little bit off in a new direction, but I hope that's okay. Yeah, very interesting answer. Thank you for sharing that. So maybe you can go to audience question. Uh, so okay, we have seven questions. So we I think we can have the time for that. So we'll see. Cool. So the first question from Magnus, he asks us about what is your opinion on control at the inf inference and how to learn system dynamics in a such a setting? More specifically, uh, how do we induce, uh, induce uh, exploratory behavior in system performing control as an uh, inference? Yeah, um, and there's a lot of places to go with this question. Um, the first, maybe, maybe just the first uh, point is that to do good system identification, at least in all of the cases I've seen with, you know, machine learning, deep learning, Cindy, linear modeling, you name it, like from common until now, you need rich, transient data and inputs. You need to excite your system and excite the response of your system to different kinds of inputs um, and kick your system and see how it responds. And it's kind of, you know, it makes sense to us as humans colloquially, right? Like you can't really tell how a person is going to behave until you put them under a little pressure, until you kind of take them out of equilibrium and see them respond, right? Like that's how you really get to know someone. Um, and that's the same thing for your control system. So, so that, that's the first one. You need that, that, that kind of input data. Um, maybe the second point is it's hard to get that data when you have your system actively being controlled through feedback control. So in some sense, the better my feedback controller is, the harder it is to identify what the actual system is. Because the, if, the, if you're doing your job as a feedback controller, you're actually rejecting all of those disturbances and you're regulating your system into a very kind of boring or nominal behavior. Mm -hmm. And so you can identify the closed loop, the closed loop behavior, but it's harder to kind of disambiguate the effect of control and your internal or latent system dynamics. And so that's a lot of work goes into that disambiguation. And actually Josh Proctor, uh, our, our close collaborator at the Institute for Disease Modeling has done a lot of work on this for uh, disease modeling systems. Because like, let's say you're working on polio or malaria, this big complicated system of disease spreading across a continent. You can't stop treating people and stop intervention, you know, control campaigns, just so you can measure what the natural system dynamics are for a couple of years. Like there's huge ethical issues with that and it's not practical. So you have to develop these algorithms that allow you to separate out what the system would have done if you didn't do any control from how effective your control is. And I think that's a really cool example of, of why you need these kind of online inference tools. Interesting, yeah. We have a question also from uh, Nazir. Uh, he asks us about, I'm a beginner in robotics and a high school student who is really into physics and informatics and doesn't know what to do. I want to study uh, the, this subject because it sounds interesting and I want to discover what it looks like. What responsibility comes with pursuing a career in this domain? What responsibilities? Yeah, um, yeah that's, I mean, 
That's a really good question. I don't, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a roboticist myself. Um, I know some excellent roboticists. Um, and from what I can tell, they're pretty cool. Like it's a pretty cool career. Um, I don't know if you, if you go back to when television was invented and you go and look at like, you know, black and white TV uh, from my parents' generation, robots were a part of the future. And it was a part of our science fiction culture. And it was a part of where we as humans felt like we were going and it still is, right? Robots are still a part of our future. Now they're a part of our present as well. So, you know, I think I personally have a lot of confidence that robotics is going to be here for a long time and it's going to be a very you know central part of our world and it clearly has been right so automation industrial automation um safety applications like there's so many applications where robots are are really critical um very practical advice i would say for someone learning and for someone kind of in that transitional period you will never regret building a very strong foundation in math, applied math, and physics. For example, linear algebra, differential equations, probability and statistics, optimization. If you learn those, those basic pillars of math, you'll be able to do anything you want. You'll be able to do robotics, machine learning, you know, you name it. And that's kind of the, the foundation that all of this is built on. Um, and just be curious, you know, like don't stop reading science fiction. Don't stop being curious about what the future could be just because it's not there yet. Wonderful. Yeah. And there's a question also from Rohan. Uh, he asks us, where do you see modern control techniques and reinforce, reinforcement learning being de uh, deployed to control system, such as Google using it for calling data centers? Yeah, um, right. So so in the modern era for really hard control problems, usually I think there's kind of two flavors. There's model predictive control. And if you look at any industrial applications, usually it's gonna be model predictive control if it's complicated. Um, so if you think about construction equipment, you know these are pretty important and expensive machines. There's safety issues that can't bang into each other. And those are using model predictive controllers uh, to maneuver their their positions even with uncertain loads and uncertain geometries and things. Um, so I feel sometimes like the machine learning community just forgets that control theory is even a field that exists. Um, and model predictive control is maybe the most obvious place where machine learning can help us to build those models. And it's it's already super robust. It's already pretty bomb proof. Like it's an incredible technology model predictive control. That said, I know everyone gets excited about reinforcement learning. I think reinforcement learning is cool also. Um, and it's probably because there have been very impressive demonstrations like AlphaGo and you know things like that that you just can't do with any other technique. Um, it is extremely expensive. Reinforcement learning is approaching brute force in terms of its computation. It's it's that's an overstatement and there are ways of, of reining it in and making it more efficient. But you know, anyone who's tried to reinforce a learning algorithm like a really cheesy one knows that these optimizations are pretty inefficient. Um, so you can learn incredible things if you have nearly infinite resources like Google has um, or some of these you know, national labs or really big institutes where you're using a significant portion of the nation's supercomputing, you can, you can do these things. Um, I think oftentimes the trick is to package what you learn into something that's useful for engineering. So we are learning, you know, reinforcement learning solutions for turbulence and for control of fluids. And by we, I mean the community, not my group, um, but our colleagues. How do you package that into a model or, you know, a policy that you can ship out that can learn, that can generalize or can be transferred to other situations? I don't think we've, we've learned that yet. And that's super important. <laughs> um, to do or else you're kind of just burning a lot of fossil fuels or, or you know whatever you're spending a lot of energy to yes. to learn these things yeah there's a question from Sergio. he asks is the design and operation of gas turbine is strongly depend on fluid dynamics and combustion which is the most promising application of machine learning to turbine machinery design or control so the most promising application of machine learning to turbo machinery design and control, that's super interesting. Um, and I, 
you know, again, I'm not, I'm not a turbo machinery expert. I have some colleagues who are. Um, so these are, maybe I'll, I'll take a, a larger question, which is there are certain fields of aerospace engineering that have been around for a hundred years, right? Like Boeing has been making, making airplanes for a long time before computers, they were making, you know, safe, uh, performant aircraft to get people around. So how can we use that data from that hundred years to make better aircraft or better turbines or better, you know, engines or whatever, whatever field of aerospace you're in, how can we use the history of our data to build better products in the future? And that's a super important question. Um, and I guarantee you all of the big companies are, are thinking about this. So like GE, Pratt & Whitney, Boeing, Airbus, you know, they're all thinking about how do you capitalize on that mountain of historical data. Mm -hmm. um, for example, a couple of areas that we can immediately use machine learning to help. There are kind of two levels of abstraction that are useful when you're developing, you know, some turbo machinery. One is, you want to actually be able to run high fidelity numerical simulations of the detailed turbulence uh, inside that engine so that you can measure things like, uh, you know, power loss or drag on the blades or force, you know, basically forces and moments on the, on the structure. You want to be able to measure all of those things. And machine learning is currently giving us tremendous advances in turbulence modeling. So getting more accurate, more efficient models of that turbulence at a coarse grain using uh, essentially machine learning for closure modeling. So that, that's one area which is very much trying to capture all of the detailed physics or the effect of all the detailed physics. But on a much more abstract level, you know, they're developing these different blades shapes, right? So they have, um, you know, some parameterized model of what of this blade shape. And there is some output variable they care about. How hot does the material get? How much thrust do I get? You know, how efficient it is? I, I'm making these up, but like there are a few numbers they care about. Is my metal going to melt? Am I going to get good performance? Things like that. And so now I'm not worrying about the billion dimensional fluid that's inside that's making everything happen. I'm just trying to learn a map from blade geometry to these three or four numbers that I care about as an engineer. That can also be learned with machine learning. And you know, you know that these companies have done hundreds, thousands, you know, tens of thousands of tests on different blade geometries. So they have all of that data that they can kind of leverage and combine into those models. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So he has also a question. What is the state of the art on sensor placement and fluid flow measurement? There are dozens of different methods which which is the most reliable for flow with a strong nonlinearities like boundary layer, choke uh, interaction, and which one normal flow such as flow around an airfoil? Yeah, so sensing inside of flows is still very challenging and it's mm -hmm. still completely, I think, kind of an open area of research. And that's to some extent why we have so many different approaches to fluids. We have, you know, if you're going to study a real system and you're going to, let's say, put it on an aircraft wing or in an engine and you're going to put people in the air on this technology, we're going to be running laboratory experiments where we use laser sheets to measure the flow field to see what the flow is doing. And we're going to have other measurement technologies in that experiment. We're going to run, uh, you know, uh, computational fluid dynamics to see things that you can't measure in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. When we build the device, we're going to deploy sensors on that device so that we're constantly monitoring its state. And so we're basically going to be doing all of the above because it's, it's important. And we don't know how to just put a few sensors on a wing and get all of that information that you would have gotten from the laboratory or from the, the simulation. You need all of that information. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there are a few kind of mathematical areas that I think are interesting. Some of these are around sparse sensor placement um, that we've been developing where you can kind of, if you have a library of flow fields you've seen in the past of patterns that you have seen, you can kind of infer what patterns are active and in what mixture with a few sparse sensors. This doesn't really use any physics, it just uses past data. There are researchers that then use um, the Navier-Stokes equations themselves to see if those solutions you're getting are consistent with the equations, are physically consistent uh, with the measurements, with the Navier-Stokes equations. 
and that gives you an even better estimation, but it's expensive. You're now running this against a simulation, so it's hard to view this in real time. Um, in the last few years, there have been some pretty exciting neural network developments in uh, going from few measurements to full flow field reconstructions also, um, although those are still pretty um, kind of nascent. Mm -hmm. um, for dealing with a Copment operator framework, how much deep knowledge one require of linear operatory theory and spectral theory and helper spaces? That's a great question. It depends on who you ask. <laughs> so, um, so Koopman operator theory for dynamical systems is this approach. This is related to that time delay model I was talking about earlier, where even for strongly nonlinear systems, there is a theorem that there are coordinate transformations where those strongly nonlinear systems look linear through this lens of these new coordinates, the, the system looks linear. Mm -hmm. And this is related to the Koopman operator from, from the 1930s. Um, so it's actually quite timely. We just wrote a 96 page review paper on Koopman operator theory on the archive. Um, myself, Marco Budicic, uh, Erika Kaiser and Nathan Kutz. And so to some extent, um, I don't think about Hilbert spaces and spectral operator theory very much. I mean, I do when I need to, but that's not my central theme. I think about how do I get these approximations from data? How do I do, I think of linear algebra and differential equations, right? So very kind of practical uh, computational linear algebra. But uh, Marco, who is a co-author on this paper, you know, he thinks about spectral theory and operator theory and infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces a lot. And so this review kind of has these dueling perspectives of the deep math and of the very uh, practical applied numerical linear algebra. And I would say, if you want to start dabbling in this field, you don't need that much. You'll mm. start with dynamic mode decomposition. You'll start with linear algebra in finite dimensions. But very quickly, you'll run into issues like, you know, continuous eigenvalue spectra and, um, you know, just, just general mathematical issues that arise in, in the Koopman operator framework. And you'll need to at least have the ability to converse with someone who does know about Hilbert spaces and operator theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, uh, there's another question from Daraj. Like, it's the same question also here. Uh, how can one choose the closest basis function in Sandy algorithm? If most of the selected basis function obtained from several combination didn't work, also how can you relate Sandy algorithm with uh, with kernel based algorithm? I hope it's right. So, yeah. Yeah, um, that's a really interesting question. Um, so I think the first question is kind of about closures. How do you get closed bases? Um, and the the short answer is we don't know. That's an open question. It's to me that's one of the most important open questions in applied system identification and Koopman theory is for a given system of interest, for a given set of measurements, how do I build a functional basis that will, again, give me these linearizing transforms? And that's at the very frontier of the questions we're asking. So you're asking the right questions. Um, we don't know yet. And very, very bright people, people with a lot more mathematical kind of sophistication than I have are working super hard on, on developing those kinds of closed spaces. Um, in terms of Cindy, relating it to kernel methods, that's a very interesting question. Um, it is an area of research that is currently being developed. So Cindy, uh, the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics is related to the dynamic mode decomposition and the extended dynamic mode decomposition. And uh, Matt Williams, Clancy Rowley, and Yanis Kevrakidis developed a kernelized version of that algorithm about five years ago that is very widely used. Uh, recently, our German colleagues have done a kind of tensor version of Cindy that you can think of. It's it's in spirit. It's a lot like uh, it's a lot like these kernel methods. You're kind of folding up a bunch of nonlinearities into a tensor. Uh, and then also, um, we're currently working with uh, Peter Badu, Benjamin Herman, and Beverly McKeon kind of merging these ideas of kernelized DMD and Cindy. So, so I actually think that that paper should come out on the archive in a, a couple of months, um, something mm -hmm. like a kernelized Cindy. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a request from uh, Kelly. She asks you, could you make a video and how driven optimal control? She asks you about that. 
and um, we have a question I'll put it on the list. Yeah. <laughs> and also a question from um, Constantian. I hope this is right. How important is the development of graphical tools like CLink and yeah, open you know, for model based control application, the graphical tools? I mean, I don't think it can be overstated how important it is. So, you know, Python is incredible and we use Python all the time for machine learning, for scientific computing. And a lot of people are moving from MATLAB to Python because it's open source. But if you think about why people are staying with MATLAB, there's MATLAB is, it still has a hold on the engineering control community. I would say largely because of Simulink. It has an incredible interface for control systems and Simulink is just such an easy, fast way of prototyping and developing things. Um, you know, I often will go to Simulink instead of writing a script because it's just so much easier and faster and I can probe the system. So I think graphics are a, a big deal. Um, and, and if I have one complaint about, you know, Python, it's maybe that the community is not putting enough emphasis on, on graphics because it is so important for, you know, for communicating. That's how we communicate largely. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there's good graphics packages for Python, but it's maybe a little easier to make things look nice in some of these yeah. commercial software. Right. Yeah. So do you have any final advice was given to you and was the life changing? You would like to. Best advice was given to you and was the life changing? Advice given to me. Um, yeah, I mean, so actually, this is advice I got indirectly from my wife's. So my wife got this advice from her advisor. Um, so I hope that this is this is certainly going to lose something in translation. Um, but I think it's really important. You know, you get to work on something that uh, is interesting, important, and that you're good at. Those are kind of the three things you hope for: is that you get to work on something that's, that's interesting to you, that you actually care about, that is important, that the world cares about and that you're good at, that you're actually able to, to move the needle on. And honestly, if you can find something that has two of those, you're super lucky. So, you know, interesting, important, and something you're good at. And asking for all three is maybe too much to ask for. If you get, you know, incredibly lucky, maybe, but we should be happy if we can find something where we get two of those things. Very important advice. So thank you once again, Professor Stephen. I, it was really inspiring and I really enjoyed it a lot. So thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the invitation. Thank you. Thank you.